Since Nexia has introduced the app router, there have been a few different ways of rendering content to your screen. Think about React server components, obviously, but now also streaming and partial pre-rendering. Those topics can become quite complicated, so I wanted to give you an example of how you can compare those rendering methods with something like building a Lego house. For me, it's quite an easy way to remember exactly how it works, so maybe it is for you too. Alright, but before we start building a Lego house, let's first discuss what is a rendering method. And a rendering method is basically a way of uh, handling a request and rendering content to the screen of the user. It should in the end be a fully functional website, of course. And um, that can be done in different ways. You can render content on the client, you can render content on the server. You can also time things differently. So you can first handle as much as possible on the server and then send everything to the client and do as little as possible there. Or you can give a quick response so that the client can start showing at least something and then later on send the rest of the data to the client. So those are different ways of rendering content to the screen. And as I mentioned, Next.js came up with a, a new app router and with that, with some new and different ways of rendering your content. But before we're going to dive into that, let's first discuss client-side rendering because that's one of the most basic ways of rendering your content. And you should have a good understanding of this before we dive into server components and everything beyond that. But how can we compare client-side rendering with something like building a Lego house? Well, let's look at it this way. Let's say someone wants to build a Lego house but doesn't have any Lego item yet. So the person needs to go to the Lego store. Um, and in there, we're going to buy a few different blocks, a green plateau and for example, a doorbell. Uh, but this doorbell doesn't include an actual battery. That's something that you have to buy yourself. But luckily, we still have that at our home. So uh, we got the items, we go back home and we start building the house. It's still a very basic house, but we do have the battery. So we include it into the doorbell and the doorbell actually works. So we can now ring, but there's no door in the actual house yet. So we're not going to be able to get inside. So in a way, I guess you could say that the house is now interactive, but it's not really what I'm looking for because I want to get inside of the house. So what we're going to do is we go back to the Lego store to actually buy some useful Lego items like the door and also a window for some light and I guess a fence for, well, um, for your garden, obviously. So after having been at the Lego store for the second time, um, we go back home and we start improving our house to something that's um, actually what we want. It has a door now, a doorbell still works, and we can go inside of the house. And at this point, I think we can be quite happy with the house that we've built. Now, I can imagine that you're thinking like, how is this in any way related to a rendering method or client-side rendering at all? So let's take a look at that. So let's say a user wants to visit a website. So it goes to a specific URL that's similar to going to the Lego store. And the server that's actually listening to that URL contains all the files that we're looking for. So for example, the HTML file, which we'll get first, and then um, some JavaScript and CSS files as well. And those will all be sent back to the client. And at the client, once we have all those files, we're able to do an initial render. Uh, and that initial render will well, give you a big idea of how the website's going to look, but it will not contain the actual data that you're probably looking for on that page. So yeah, often we fill that area with something like a skeleton or a loading spinner, while quite often the, the header, for example, is already uh, pre-filled. In this case, that's not the case, but uh, quite often you'll see that the header is always uh, part of the initial render. And at this point, we reach the first paint and the time to interactive. Now the first paint basically means that um, we see something that's not white on the screen. So in this case, we get to see a, a bit of the structure. Um, and the time to interactive is the time it takes before the, your website becomes interactive. So for example, if in the header would be a link now, then we could click on that link and it would send us to a different page. And these moments in time are quite important if you look at different rendering methods, because depending on the rendering method that you choose, um, for example, the time to interactive might be at a later or earlier point um, compared to client-side rendering. All right, so it's great that our website is interactive now, but it's not really what I'm looking for because I want 
to see the actual data and not some kind of skeleton right here. So for that, we're going to go back to the server and we're going to get actual useful data like um, querying a database, calling another API or getting some data out of some files, for example. And you can kind of compare that with when we went back to the Lego store to get the actual useful Lego items that we wanted to improve our initial house. Because in the same way, we're now getting actual useful data to improve the initial render of the website. So we've got the useful data from the server and now we can send that back to the client. And the client can then process all that data and yeah, render a actual useful uh, page with the content that you probably were looking for. And at that point, we reach the first content full paint. So that's after all the content for the entire page has been loaded. Now, I'm telling you this in a way that you're probably thinking, why would I do this twice? Like, for example, why would I buy a few items for my house and then go back to the Lego store to buy more items to build an entire house? That doesn't make any sense. But that is how we've been doing it in the web for quite a long time now. Um, Client-side rendering does actually call the server multiple times and uh, some of those things can be done in a single time. So that's not very efficient. And that's also one of the reasons why some other rendering methods are becoming even more popular right now. All right, now all these examples might give you a vague idea of what client-side rendering is, but I'm going to show you some examples as well. So let's create a clean project with the React TypeScript template. Install the dependencies. And instead of running the uh, dev command, we're now actually going to run the build command so that we're not including all the development uh, tools in the browser because that makes it a little bit unclear um, which files are actually being fetched when we go to the page. So now that we've built it, we can run preview and that will set up a local server at port 4173. So if we open it up and we open the dev tools in the network tab, once we refresh, you'll see everything that's being loaded. So if we refresh, you can see it as going to the Lego, Lego store where in the Lego store or at the server in our case, we're first getting the index.html file. And if we look at the response of this file, you'll see that it's very basic. Let me zoom in here. It just contains a small hat and a body with only a root div. So there's no content in it yet. And besides that, you can see that there's also a script and a link uh, tag for the JavaScript and CSS that's bundled. But you can imagine if you would look at this page, you'll actually get to see a white screen because this div doesn't contain any content you can also see this in the preview there's nothing to see here but that is only because we haven't loaded in the javascript and css yet because that's what happens right after uh loading in the html file there needs to be one entry point and that's the html file before it can load in uh, other files uh, in our diagram i mentioned this as a single step like we go to the server and we get our files similar to how you get everything from the Lego store. But this happens in yeah, several really small, fast requests after each other. And once that's all loaded, we have enough data available to actually load this entire page because this whole page does not depend on any API or a database. This is all just static content. So if we would look, for example, at this feed plus react piece of code, you'll see that that is inside of this JavaScript file somewhere right here. So that basically means that we don't need to do an additional call to the server, as I've mentioned in this diagram. Um, so after the initial render, we would do a call to the server to get actual useful data. Um, we don't need to do that yet because there is no real useful data here. This is all just static content. But in a real world scenario, you would probably need to do that because in a real world scenario, just static content isn't that interesting. So let's implement a basic example where we're using a use effect to form an API call to, um, for example, this endpoint, which will give us a list of all the countries. And um, then we actually only want a JSON out of that. And we want to set the amount of countries inside of our state. So let's create a amount of countries variable that will be zero by default and then here set it based on the response.length 
Now this is going to error because the response is currently a promise. So we need to wrap it in a uh, function like async effect, for example. And then we need to actually call that function. Now, if we want to display the amount of countries, then we can do that somewhere here like this. Now, what you'll see is that when we go back to the browser, if I refresh, you'll first see that the amount of countries is zero. And then once the request is done, it will set it to 250. I can make that more clear by changing the uh, network speed to slow 3G. Um, let me remove the network re request and reload. It takes some time to load. You see that it's zero right now. And only after a little while, it becomes 250. And that is because there needs to be made an additional API request right now. Um, and in this case, I'm using a uh, external API, but this could as well have been our own server that we would call. Oh, and make sure to add the empty dependency array. Now I can imagine that you're thinking, why would I use this rendering method if, um, if it's not that optimal, if there are better solutions for this? And well, one of the reasons is that client side rendering renders um, an initial version of the page very fast. So the first paint and the time to interactive are really early. And another reason might be that you want really cheap hosting because client side rendered apps only serve static files. So you can host that on a CDN, which is a lot cheaper than, for example, a Node.js server. But quite often you'll see that you need a server anyways to, uh, to show actual useful data. So more often than not, that won't be a real good argument. So I think in most cases, uh, there are better rendering methods to use than client-side rendering. And that was actually everything I wanted to tell you about client-side rendering. So if you became curious about how I'm going to compare, for example, React server components we're building in LEGO House, make sure to subscribe and I'll see you in the next one.